Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 8th of December. We're going to start to get a bit more Christmassy. As always, I have the chapters, so you can jump to any particular update you care about the most. New videos this week. So I dived into Azure Copilot. What it is, how it's working, what it's allowed to do and access, um, to give you some idea of what's coming and to give you some confidence with actually using it in your organization. And I created a video about how you should think of messaging a cost optimization exercise in your organization. I'm seeing a lot of companies uh, doing it a not so fantastic way. I want to avoid just a very blanket, everyone has to cut cost 10% or whatever it might be. So I just walked through why this doesn't work very well and maybe some approaches to do it a bit better. On to what's new. So on the compute side, Azure Kubernetes service for the standard tier, i.e. the paid SLA, not the free tier, now has a 5,000 node standard limit and up to 100,000 pods running on that. So I can really now um, implement these really huge clusters. The AKS API breaking change detection has gone GA. So this is all about I'm moving from one version of Kubernetes to a newer supported version of Kubernetes. And what it's going to do is look at, well, based on that intended goal version, am I using some API that's been deprecated and then would break my deployment? So it's going to save me time from doing the upgrade and then trying to work out why this isn't working. AKS node auto provision is in preview. So this is basically the idea of ordinarily when I have a node pool, it's going to be able to automatically create nodes, all of the exact same configuration based on that node pool. So what this feature does is it's going to look at the workloads, going to look at the shape and the type of resource it needs, and then we'll create that back end VM based on what shape, i.e. the particular type of VM, is it memory optimized, general purpose, maybe compute optimized, that best fits what I need for the workloads that it's trying to provision these for. So it's a really cool feature and it should really just help me reduce wasted costs by having the wrong shape virtual machines. There's some improved AKS cost insight. So this is for standard and premium clusters. And basically if I go into cost analysis today, I, I see the AKS resource. But what this is doing is it's bringing in the uh, open cost, open project that will then give me more detail on the specific components and how they're interacting with my overall cost. So it just gives me a more granular view into the cost of my AKS environment. I can now develop Azure Functions on my Apple Silicon Macs. So this will work for my Azure Functions using Node.js, uh, .NET, PowerShell, Python, Java. So if I'm an Apple uh, Mac user, I can locally now develop those Azure Functions for all of those supported uh, runtimes. And then Azure SQL Trigger for Azure Functions. So remember Azure Functions is serverless. The whole point is there's some event that triggers this code to run. So now what I can do with this Azure SQL trigger is if there's some change to an Azure SQL table, uh, maybe I'm modifying a row, I'm creating a row, it can trigger the Azure function to now perform some capability based on that. It's for the Elastic Premium and the dedicated plans. So now assuming I've got that change tracking turned on, I can now have events driven by the changes to the database. And of course, Azure Functions already has input and output binding to Azure SQL database. So I can then go and read additional data, I can go and write to it, but it's now a really nice integration. And this works with Azure SQL database, Azure SQL MI and SQL Server running in Azure VMs. On the networking side, so if I move, if I'm using Azure Data Explorer, the recommendation, if I'm using the VNet injection today, move to private endpoints. Really, this is to remove complexity, remove limitations on scalability, public IP dependencies, and there's a new, um, basically, experience that lets you do that migration in a very seamless way. That migration experience is in preview right now, 
but it's there and enables me to more seamlessly move to the preferred private endpoint uh, based integration with the virtual network. On the database side, so PostgreSQL Flexible has enhanced DR. And this is a really nice capability and what it's adding are virtual endpoints. And we're probably used to seeing these today with other databases. So I get a virtual endpoint for the write, i.e. the primary, and then I get a virtual endpoint for the read, the replica. So now if there's a switch, I don't have to change my app. I just focus on, hey, I'm doing my interactions with the right virtual endpoint. If there's a failover, which is now integrated with these virtual endpoints, it just switches them. So the replica becomes the primary, the primary becomes the replica, the virtual endpoints switch. So as the app, I just carry on talking to that virtual endpoint. So it's now a very nice integrated experience. I can still take the replica and promote it to a standalone server if I wanted to, I remove it from the replication. But now that kind of native experience will just switch them and move the virtual endpoint to a really seamless client app experience. And then PostgreSQL Flexible now has PostgreSQL 16 support. So those newer capabilities, the better logical replication and the faster bulk data loading. And there's, there's a bunch of other things around it I can now take advantage of in GA. And MySQL Flexible now has accelerated log support. So what this does is it boosts the performance of the servers by moving the logs for business critical service tier to faster storage. Now that means it's, I think, a two times query import, and there's also a 50% reduction in the latency. It doesn't cost me anything extra. It's just a feature I can go and turn on in preview, and it's just gonna move them again to faster storage, lower latency storage, to improve my all-up performance. On the miscellaneous side, so EventGrid, remember EventGrid is all about this service that can sit there and monitor these sources of events and then trigger these event handlers. This could be Azure Functions, it could be a webhook, there's a whole bunch more of them. And the point of what this does is, I now as that receiving service, I don't have to do a hammer poll. I, do you have something for me? Do you have something for me? Do you have something for me? EventGrid does that for me or call me when there's an event that I care about. So now it's gonna work with the Azure Health and the resource management system. So there's two different aspects to this. The health service is, hey, I have Azure resources, um, a single instance VM, a virtual machine scale set. Um, there, there's some other things. If there's a status change, I, I'm unavailable, it can go and create that. If there is a resource annotated, so there's something about my resources being impacted by another disruption, it's gonna create event and call the event handlers. And then also for the Azure resource notification, if there's some change at the control plane, so this could be created or updated or deleted, again, it will call those event handlers. So it just gives me a way to tap into the health, major changes at the control plane, and call whatever I want to go and handle those events. And it's now just uh, a built-in topic for me. And then Azure Site Recovery Rollup, November 2023. Really, this is all about a lot of support for Rocky Linux, a whole set of versions for Rocky Linux, and Sue say Linux Enterprise uh, 15 SP5, and then for Windows 11. So it's really all about upgrades to those supported operating systems. And then Windows 365 in Gov, so Windows 365 for Gov, now has that boot capability, so I can boot from my machine directly into my Windows 365 instance, and also switch. So my Windows 365 just sits on my taskbar, makes it very easily integrated. There were some other changes. There's a new report that can show me the status of actions successful or if they failed, and it will give me the reason for the failure, and a few other things. So just some nice updates there. And that was it. As always, I hope that was useful. Until next video, take care.